It's me, Alwyn. Today I want to talk about Albireo, one of my favorite stars. So Albireo, when you first look at it, appears to be one star if you look at it with your naked eye. But if you use a telescope instead, then you'll notice that what the one star is actually two stars very close together, and you can't tell with your naked eye. But with a telescope, you zoom in, and then it becomes two stars. This is called resolving the binary. It turns out that one of the pairs is itself another binary, but for now, let's just talk about these two. The nice, unique thing about Albireo is one of them is blue and one of them is a bright amber. You may wonder, what makes different stars have different colors? Normally with your naked eye, you see the stars in the sky and they're all white. So perhaps you've never even heard that different stars can be different colors. It turns out that our sun is roughly a green star, but really it appears white to us because we evolved to see the sun as white light. But there are also red stars and there are blue stars. And so what makes these different stars, well, appear different? The answer is in two parts. Part one is, the, is to ask, why should the color of a star depend on the surface of the star? And the answer to that is temperature. The hotter something is, the more it tends to glow blue rather than red. Part two is, of the answer is regarding the question, well, why should different stars have different surface temperatures? And the answer to that will come from the reason that stars keep themselves up against gravity using pressure. So let's start with part one. Why is it that a higher temperature substance ends up glowing bright blue? You might have seen a blue flame as opposed to a red flame, and I bet someone has told you before that a blue flame is hotter than a red flame. You might also have seen a piece of metal left in an oven for a long time will start to glow red before it was black, but it was really emitting infrared, which is something you and I also emit. But then it becomes red, and then if you heat it up even more, it becomes white, and even more, and then it becomes blue. So we know from some of our everyday experiences that the hotter something is, the more it does tend to emit blue rather than red or infrared. But why is this? Well, ultimately, temperature is an expression of internal kinetic energy, or internal heat energy. Imagine boiling a kettle of water. Of course, you light a flame under the kettle, and energy from the flame goes into the kettle. This is pretty intuitive to us. In order to increase the temperature of something, you need to increase the energy. And so it's pretty intuitive to us that temperature and energy should have something in common. There should be some relationship between the two. It turns out that a higher temperature material has more kinetic energy within that material. So for example, for a gas, when you have more kinetic energy, it means the gas particles are wiggling about faster. They're zooming about and colliding into one another and wiggling faster. Within a solid, you have a similar situation. The solids are connected together. Sometimes if they're in a lattice, you can think of them as being connected by springs, and the hotter it is, the more those springs are wiggling, the more things within the solid are wiggling. A higher temperature substance has constituent particles or atoms that are wiggling faster. The result is that the internal energy, which is corresponding to that wiggling, is higher for something that's higher temperature. More temperature, more energy, more wiggling. Now it turns out when you wiggle things a lot, you get light. So what is light? Well, light is ultimately a wiggle 
in the electromagnetic field. You may have heard that light is the propagation of electromagnetic radiation. If you want to understand why light propagates, that's a story for another day. It has to do with Maxwell's equations and how electric fields affect magnetic fields and how magnetic fields affect electric fields and how this, this self-interaction can keep a light wave propagating through space at, well, the speed of light. But to get back to the topic, let's imagine a simpler kind of wave. Let's imagine I shake my hand and I'm holding a slinky or a jump rope. Then you'll imagine that there's a wiggle in the slinky and the jump rope. That's me exciting a wave in the slinky or jump rope. That's me exciting a wave in a medium, where the medium is the slinky or the jump rope. The excitation of that wave, that wave itself carries energy, and in this way light carries energy, because light is a wiggle. Wiggles carry energy. If you imagine sitting in a pool and you wiggle your hand at, on the surface of the pool, you will also excite waves throughout the pool, and those waves will carry energy. They will lose that energy through friction and sound, and you will hear the splashing about of your waves. But the point is, when you put energy in with your hand on the pool, you, the energy goes into waves on the surface of the pool, and the waves are just wiggles, wiggles that move about. If you believe me that light is a electromagnetic field excitation, or a wiggle in the electromagnetic field, then you might also expect that when particles, charged particles, well, particles that interact with electromagnetic fields, ones with charges, because, you know, charges are what determine electric fields and magnetic fields, if you wiggle a charge, that which can wiggle the electromagnetic field, the faster you wiggle the charge, the more energy will come out and the more energy will come out in wiggles. The faster you move it, the more energetic the wiggle. And so higher frequency wiggles lead to higher frequency light, and higher frequency light should correspond to higher energy light. The individual packets of light, the individual excitations of the electromagnetic field will be higher energy. And so different kinds of light at different frequencies have different energies. It turns out that this is what leads to different colors. We have these things called rods and cones in the back of our retina. It turns out that rods and cones are designed to absorb photons, little packets of light, and the chemical reactions that govern whether a cone absorbs or doesn't absorb a photon, and whether it sends a impulse down the neuron that goes to your brain depends on the energy of light. It turns out that's the only way to distinguish different kinds of light, and therefore that's the only way to distinguish different kinds of color. It turns out that what we perceive to be blue is higher energy light. Blue and ultraviolet, x-ray and gamma ray are all higher energy light photons. Red, infrared, microwave, and radio are all lower energy photons at lower frequencies. So far, I've discussed how temperature leads to energy wiggling, higher frequency, and therefore color. The higher temperature something is, the bluer the color. And so it is in this way that a bl bluer star has a higher surface temperature. The surface of the star is going to be at a higher temperature. It'll be hotter, its atoms will be wiggling faster, and it will be emitting a larger number of blue photons compared to red photons, and therefore will appear blue. Hot star, blue star. Cold star, red star. If you get even colder, then the star will only be emitting infrared. And that's when they start to look darker or brown, and that's how you get brown dwarfs, or things like Jupiter, where the dark side is only emitting infrared, 
or things like human bodies. We only emit infrared. We don't emit visible light. The visible light you see right now is just reflected from my, from my, from my lamp. So that's part one. Temperature leads to color. Part two, why should different stars have different surface temperatures? Well, why does a star have a surface temperature in the first place? The answer is a balance between nuclear fusion in the center and gravity throughout the star. Gravity pulls all parts of a star together because, well, gravity pulls all things together. And in order to counteract the inward gravity, there must be some outward force, something holding the star up. Stars are awfully massive, and so an enormous amount of pressure is required. And what provides that pressure in stars is temperature pressure. You can imagine that the center of a star is hotter because that's where all of the nuclear fusion is adding the energy. And the outside of the star is cooler. And as you know, heat moves from hot to cold. This gradient in the heat basically will also lead to heat energy moving from hot to cold. You probably know this pretty intuitively too. If you take some hot water and cold water and put them together, heat will move from the hot water into the cold water. Heat moves from hot to cold, and so in a star where it's hot in the center and cold outside, and the outside is touching the surface of space, the heat is moving from the hot center to the cold exterior. The movement of heat can be thought of as in two ways. The temperature difference leads to pressure difference, which leads to an outward force. This outward force keeps the star afloat. It keeps it from collapsing and becoming a black hole. When the pressure is not enough, that's when it becomes a neutron star or black hole. Part two is to think about the energy budget. Since energy is moving outward, that means there must be energy flowing outward. We call this a luminosity, an energy loss per time. The star is losing energy as, it, as the energy moves from the inside to the outside and ultimately loses the energy to space. It is this loss of energy through the surface of the star that relates to its temperature. The hotter the star is per surface area, the more light will come out. It turns out that in, that in order to balance gravity, a star's surface temperature will be set by the need for the inward pressure to support gravity, and that inward pressure will also, or outward pressure, I'm sorry, outward pressure will also be balanced by an outward energy flow. The outward energy flow paired with the surface area of the star will determine the temperature of the star. So it turns out that for a main sequence star, a star burning hydrogen, the hotter a star is corresponds to how massive the star is. The more massive it is, the more pressure it needs to hold itself up. And so the more nuclear fusion occurs at the center under those high temperatures and pressures, and also the more energy has to leave through the surface of the star. More massive stars require higher temperatures at the surface in order to provide the necessary higher pressure and higher energy loss that goes along with that pressure. And so for main sequence stars, hotter stars are bluer stars. Hotter stars are more massive stars. More massive stars are bluer stars. Here's a little bonus. Because more massive stars are hotter and brighter, but and have more fuel because they're more massive and they're basically burning their own mass in order to continue being a light. You may wonder, how long can a more massive star last? Does it end up lasting longer or shorter? It turns out that more massive stars have shorter lives because they shine so bright and burn their fuel so fast. Massive stars tend to be younger because their maximum age is shorter, just as the typical ant will be younger than the typical human because ants die so tragically young. 
So it turns out that hot, blue, massive stars also tend to be pretty young. The exceptions to this rule are when we're not talking about hydrogen-burning stars anymore. As a star evolves, it runs out of hydrogen to burn into helium, and so it starts burning helium into carbon. When it, the star becomes a giant, these relationships are different. The star tends to puff up, and the star tends to have a faster rate of nuclear fusion. The star tends to become very large, and the radius becomes extremely large. When the radius is large, you don't need such a high temperature anymore to keep up with the energy loss. And so you tend to have red giants. That's the end of the bonus. And I just hope that the takeaways are pretty clear, that higher temperature leads to more kinetic energy, more wiggles, faster wiggles, and therefore higher energy photons and what we perceive to be bluer photons, and that hotter stars are more massive stars, younger stars and bluer stars. Thank you very much.